Good morning, everybody. I'm Sharon Fetter, the Chief Operating Officer at Mashable. So it's Friday, it's the end of November, and it's the end of the year, which means we all need a little bit of sleep, a digital detox, and probably a lot of coffee. Uh, so now that we're all caffeinated and on our way, welcome to the 2012 Media Summit. A lot has happened since this time last year, even since this time last month, when the New York area was devastated by Hurricane Sandy. I want to thank all of you for your understanding and support for moving this event. Many of you were here as the storm wreaked havoc on the East Coast or watched online as both harrowing and inspiring stories were shared. I want to extend Mashable's condolences to those of you and your families who saw devastation from the storm. And I want to thank the many friends of Mashable who supported us and our team as we managed through. It really speaks to the heart of community. And Mashable's community is something that continues to astonish and inspire me. So thank you. Last November, we gathered in the same place to talk about technology and trends that were reshaping media. But we know that in the tech space, one year is a really long time. With 90% of the world's data having been created in the past two years alone, and smartphone penetration reaching a critical mass. Companies are emerging, folding, being acquired, and pivoting at a rapid pace. New technologies replace those that were once cutting edge, and startups dictate what people want and need by dreaming up and introducing new gadgets and apps. Remember last year, we weren't really talking that much about that thing called Pinterest. And native advertising wasn't the focus of the advertising space. We were wondering if 2012 would finally actually be the year of mobile. And the jury's still out on that. But it's certainly one of the topics we'll be discussing today. We've got a full day of content, conversation, and hopefully inspiration. And we hope you leave here with some key insights into the state of media and what it will look like in the year ahead. So before we get started, a couple of housekeeping notes. First, I want to thank our sponsor, Definition 6. And of course, we're at a Mashable event, and you're clearly all going to want to be on Wi-Fi. So we're going to have the Wi-Fi posted, uh, the Wi-Fi information posted on our screens. Um, but if you're looking around, you've also probably gotten one of these sheets. Uh, and the sheets has the Wi-Fi information, whether you're on your mobile, your tablet, or your laptop. And so what you're going to be doing is logging in. You should get a logging in page. It may take a couple of minutes, so please bear with us. And use the username Time Center, password Time Center 1 uh, on the network backstage. Great. So you're obviously also going to be tweeting a lot today, maybe posting some Instagram. So please use the hashtag Media Summit. And of course, when you need to go ahead and charge, you can charge in a charging area by our sponsor, Definition 6, in the gallery out front. There will be mics set up in the aisle, so speakers will try to do some Q&A where time permits, but they'll also be around during networking if you want to chat then. And later today, after the program, we'll be having a networking reception in the gallery. I'm really looking forward to meeting many of you then. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mashable's founder and CEO, Pete Cashmore. Pete founded Mashable in 2005 in Aberdeenshire, Scotland. His passion for sharing how web tools and social networks were transforming human interactions and reshaping cultures drove him to create what would become Mashable. Today, Mashable's more than 20 million unique monthly readers and 9 million followers across social media networks form one of the biggest online news communities. He was named to the 2012 Forbes 30 Under 30 list he was in the Times 100, and he was recently a runner-up in Mashable's annual Halloween costume contest, where he dressed up as Felix Baumgartner, the Red Bull space guy. There was a really striking resemblance. Pete has been documenting the revolution of media since 2005, and is now at the center of that transformation as Mashable's CEO. Please join me in welcoming Pete Cashmore to the stage. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. It's great to see a, uh, a full room today. And uh, I'm excited to, uh, to start off by telling you a little bit about uh, some of the stuff we're doing at Mashable and also you know, the kind of trends that we're seeing that we've seen over the past year that we expect to, uh, to happen next year and how we're going to adapt to them. 
So we've got some, uh, some announcements coming up too. Uh, so let's get going. If my clicker works. <laughs> there we go. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the trends that we're kind of adapting Mashable to. Uh, our current site uh, is not these things, and our future site will be, and it's coming very, very soon. So 2013, obviously, the big story is going to be mobile first, not desktop, right? And I'll talk a little bit through uh, how people are consuming our site and how people are consuming new sites. But for new sites in 2013, clearly, it's going to be about designing for these smaller screens. Uh, it's social first, not search. And I'll talk a little bit about why just focusing on social will actually figure out all your search problems anyway. Uh, talk a little bit about how visuals matter, how images are actually uh, somewhat at the core of social sharing online now. I'll talk a little bit about how ads are content as well. And I think this is the big trend that everyone's going to be talking about in advertising, have been for the last couple months, and will be next year. So let's talk a little bit about mobile. If you haven't seen the story of mobile this year, I don't know where you've been. Uh, PCs are actually not selling, believe it or not. This is going to be the first year, probably, um, we'll see when all the numbers come in at the end of the year, when PCs uh, sell less than in the previous year. So people aren't buying personal computers. And there's Microsoft numbers down. That's CNN money saying that uh, shipments are going to fall for the first time in 11 years, so the first time since the bubble when people have been buying less PCs than the previous year. So what are they buying? Well, they're buying tablets. So if you count tablets, PCs are actually growing because people are buying tons and tons of tablets. Makes sense, right? The tablet is the PC for everybody. It does pretty much everything you need to do. If you just want to consume content, you want to read your news, you want to watch your movies, um, tablet pretty much does it all. If you don't need uh, Photoshop and PowerPoint and all those things, you can just get a tablet. So tablets are really the big growth market. And they're starting to sap the PC market. And as you're building new sites in 2013, it's clearly the case that you need to think about consumption on this device first and not about on the desktop. Uh, smartphones, the other story of this year. Uh, smartphones are actually, according to Nielsen, about more than 50% of the phones in the US. So you know, uh, there's other data that's saying, maybe Pew saying it's about 45%. But smartphones are pretty much there in the US. There's still growth internationally. But it's pretty much a given that if people are going to be consuming your site uh, on a phone in the US, it's going to be a smartphone. And you'll want to build for that experience. But it's not the big growth story of the year. I really think uh, tablets are the big growth story. So uh, here's some data on consumption on those devices. And once you get to a stage where uh, everyone has a smartphone. Well, what's the next story? Well, it's about how are they actually going to use that? Are they actually going to consume your stuff on the smartphone? And usage is actually increasing on those devices. This is Pew. As you'll see, they say it's only about 44% of US adults have a smartphone right now. Um, tablets, 22%. But 64% of them are using them to consume news. So that's a huge number of news consumers. Uh, and you look at these news websites, and a lot of them don't look great on the tablet. Or they're doing mobile sites on the tablet. Uh, so this has got to change, and it's got to change quickly. 62% of smartphone owners get news on their device. And 66% of tablet and smartphone owners get news on their device. So that's the combined. So basically, not only are people buying tablets, but they're consuming news on them at a really fast pace. So when we're doing forward-looking builds for our site, um, and for new sites in general, it's all about building for these screens. Um, so here are all the thousands of devices. And the reason I'm telling you about this is Mashable was consumed last month on uh, 2,800 uh, 2, unique devices, right? 2,800 unique devices. So this is a challenge that we face this year as we look at do we build two thousand different versions of the site so that it looks great on every single device, that doesn't seem very practical. And you know, even though PC sales are falling, we still have to cater to that market. Um, news consumers are choosing mobile web over apps by nearly three to one. So you might wonder why I don't talk that much about apps today. Well, for news consumption, we actually don't see um, app usage across the board being huge for news brands. There are a few select ones that have enough brand clout uh, that they get strong app usage, but really, the App Store is a very top-heavy system. Unless you're really in the top 100 or so, or even the top 10 apps, uh, you're not going to get much app usage. Uh, tablets and UPCs and the rise of larger smartphones and smaller tablets means more screen sizes than ever. So, you know, every 
couple of weeks, it seems like there's a new device. You get the iPad, then you get the iPad mini, and you have uh, a new Android device seemingly every couple of weeks because they're all competing to have the best one. So there's no standardization across the screen sizes. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to build a different app for every single platform? Well, there's so many platforms, which ones are going to be the key ones? Um, what we're doing is really saying, well, if people are consuming on the mobile web, then we need to make our mobile website be amazing. And not only that, if people are coming from places like Twitter and Facebook to our mobile site versus going to an app directly, uh, then that needs to be a great experience too. And that's really the core uh, use case that we cater to, is you're on your phone, you see a headline on Twitter from our site, and you come and have a great experience. So the problem is building for thousands of screens. The solution is responsive web design, which we've just started to see take off this year. Uh, the browsers, the technology is all there, and the consumers now have uh, ways to, uh, to render this on their machines. So now more than ever, we're designing work meant to be viewed along a gradient of different experience. Responsive web design offers us a way forward, finally allowing us to design for the ebb and flow of things, and that's by the author of the book, Responsive Web Design. So this is the Boston Globe they launched earlier this year. It's been held up as a great example of responsive web design. Well, what is it? Well, you can see here, and you can actually, with most responsive web designs, you can even just play with it on a desktop screen where you shrink up the browser, everything fits perfectly. So your images resize, it detects how big your browser window is, it detects what device you're on, and it's going to serve up the right content for the screen size. So instead of saying what we would historically have called hero sizes, where you say, we're going to build one for the smartphone and one for the uh, tablet and one for the desktop computer, you can build for everything, all at once, you create a set of code that works on everything. Uh, and the Boston Globe did a pretty good job. All the images resize. The text all goes down to a single column. Um, works in landscape and portrait on your tablet devices. So this is responsive web design. You'll also hear a lot about adaptive web design next year, which tends to mean, and these are kind of used interchangeably, but it tends to mean that it snaps to specific sizes of screen uh, versus working to pixel perfect perfection. Um, this is Time. They just rolled theirs out in the last uh, couple months, I think. Same kind of deal, uh, resizing to every screen. And this is ours, which is actually, uh, I can tell you, coming out on Tuesday. So we're launching on Tuesday a whole new version of Mashable. Um, we've been in beta for a couple weeks. You can still sign up at beta.mashable.com. Um, and what we're doing is a few things which I'll talk through, but fundamentally it is a responsive web design that works on every screen, and you can do the exact same thing. You can sit in a browser and resize your window, and it'll show you pretty much what you're going to see with some exceptions. Um, and the reason for that is we don't want to build 100 times. We don't want to build an app for every single app store. We'll build for the key ones, but when a lot of our readers are coming from social already, they're coming to our mobile website, and we want that to be something really special. But we also don't think that the mobile web should be uh, something lesser than everything else, right? Because right now we serve up a mobile website, um, but as you can see, uh, we can serve the same content, the same experience, the same everything across uh, every device now. So that's the wonder of responsive design. It's also social first. So when we think about social in search, that's really changed this year. You've seen a lot of updates to, uh, to Google with the various Panda updates. Um, and the old school SEO tactics aren't quite as effective anymore. So the key thing about that is shares impact SEO. There's been a lot of studies out uh, looking into how sharing is impacting SEO. And the key thing about sharing is that it's the new linking, right? It used to be when I started out blogging that people would link to your site to say it was good. And the whole aim of the game would be to make something awesome enough to get a scoop that people would want to link to it. And then when they linked to you, you'd get more credibility in Google's index, and more people would find you, and you'd become successful. Well, now it's about convincing the individual people on social networks that your stuff's good enough to share. Um, and we know that Google is using Google Plus data. Uh, we also know that if you have a lot of shares on social, you're likely to rank higher. So this stuff is being indexed in social and being counted uh, in search and being counted as a vote. Um, also, the audience is sharing now. 41% of adult users take photos or videos they found online and repost them on sites like Pinterest, for instance. And I'll talk through a little bit about images and why they're important, too. Uh, but that's the key thing about search, 
it really follows social in our view, and we don't do a huge amount of work trying to figure out how do we rank on uh, search. If it's a choice between do we write a really great shareable headline that humans want to consume versus how many keywords can we cram in, then it's always going to be the former because the more humans that share it, the higher it's going to rank in search as well. So, uh, so this is something that's happening in social, and I haven't gone through the whole social story, um, but the, the brief on it is basically, in the US market at least, there's not going to be that many more people signing up for Facebook, right? We're pretty much reaching a maturation stage of these social networks, at least in the US. They're growing internationally. Um, but social is now a fairly mature market. And one of the new challenges that arises there is now there's just so much stuff. And the, the new challenge for social networks is, well, we've got all the people now. How do we get them to engage more? So how do we get them to spend more time on Facebook? How do we make the content more relevant? How do we make your Twitter experience uh, something more compelling and more useful? So we're starting to see, uh, you know, I stood up here last year, talked about curation. We're starting to see uh, the social networks themselves do curation layers on top of stuff. Facebook, kind of controversially now, doesn't show you everything you're subscribed to, everything you're following. Uh, it's really putting a filter on top, saying, well, what's the most shared stuff? What's the stuff you most likely want to read? Who are your top friends? Can we star them automatically? Uh, that kind of thing. So social networks are now all about showing you the top stuff, the stuff that's getting shared most. Even Twitter, with its new Discover uh, tab, which they just launched a few weeks ago, not only are they putting great images in the Discover tab now, but that's like your homepage to uh, the social world. They're trying to be a kind of a flipboard, right? They're trying to be... This is your social start page. We're going to show you all the most important stuff. You don't have to go through your full feed. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if you know, the defaults on some of these become, especially Twitter, become the overarching view versus being, hey, here's your full feed to consume. Um, so why don't news websites start to do that too? It's historically been, especially with sites like ours that started out in WordPress, it's historically been, well, we're just going to show you everything in a line. We're going to show you reverse chronological. Uh, sometimes we put editorial filters on top. But now we have this treasure trove of data where we can say, this stuff's getting shared. This stuff's taking off on the social web. Um, and what we're playing around with doing, and I think what more new sites will start playing around with doing, is trying to mine that data, be more data driven in the way we present news. Uh, so that we're actually surfacing relevant stuff to our readers versus just showing everything in reverse chronological and letting the best stuff drop off the page. Um, so this is uh, what we're doing with our new home page. The middle column, which is the next big thing, is actually powered by an algorithm. So we have an algorithm called Mashable Velocity. It's a predictive engine that figures out what is about to get shared in the future. Uh, so about an hour after we publish our stuff, we know what's going to be a hit and what's going to be a miss, and we bump it over to the, to the middle column. Um, and as it gains momentum, we move them over to the right column where it's the most shared stuff. Uh, now, clearly, this is you know, very basic in terms of this is the most popular stuff across the whole web, and I think what you'll see with new sites next year is also starting to put in personalization layers, which it says, well, of your friends, what is the stuff you're going to want to read? Um, so visuals are also something that, that we've been watching a great deal this year. Um, obviously, this year has been the rise of visual networking. And all the new networks people talk about are not the basic text updates, the retweeting, the Facebook status updates. They're kind of this movement across. These have been the buzzy social networks of the year, Pinterest, uh, Instagram. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But, you know... It's not even the case that Facebook and Twitter haven't gone in this direction because they absolutely have. If you go to your Facebook news feed now, it's full of great images. If you share images on Facebook, you'll actually get more engagement than if you share a link or even a video. Um, and the same thing with Twitter. Their new Discover tab, you're getting big images in line. We actually just updated our site, so you now get Twitter cards, which if you're not doing, you need to do, um, so that you actually represent your stories as an image versus just showing up as a link when people search for it on Twitter. So both of these sites are actually going more visual, um, and Facebook owns this one now, and um, no one owns that one yet, but we'll see. Um, so photos do drive engagement. This is a very simple um, representation of what we see on our Facebook, which is that if you post a photo, it gets more engagement than anything else. And uh, even if you want to post a link, it actually works better to just post a photo and then put a link next to it because 
If you're going through your Facebook feed, it's very, very hard to see anything that isn't a photo. Maybe they'll change the algorithm eventually so that links actually get the attention they deserve because you know, some of those headlines are really great and engaging. But right now, photos get shown off the most, uh, especially on Facebook, but also in places like Pinterest. Um, so why visual? And that's the irony of this slide, right? Because you won't remember anything that's on this slide. <laughs> um, because the top one actually tells you that you won't remember it. 90% of information transmitted to the brain is visual. Visuals are processed 60,000 times faster in the brain than text. You're sitting there, you're going through your social networks. The images are what hit you. The images are what you pause to look at. Uh, the text updates are forgotten very quickly and go by very quickly. Video is an interesting one. Uh, Posts with videos uh, attract three times more inbound links than plain text posts. That's in terms of, uh, of blogging. Video on, on Facebook and Twitter right now doesn't really get the attention it deserves and does seem to suffer a little bit, we find, from the kind of the, the pause when people think about, do I want to dedicate the next minute of my life to this? And I think we're going to see... People are always talking about, you know, it's going to be a boom time for video, and definitely mobile video consumption is increasing a great deal. Um, it's continuing to increase uh, in 2012. Um, so we are seeing a lot of mobile video consumption. I think it will be a big thing for us as a company that relies a great deal on social media. I don't feel like video is promoted as well as it could be on the social networks, um, but that's likely to change. But certainly in terms of mobile video apps, I think that's where a lot of the action is in video, is really having an app. It's an experience. You're already in it. You're not sitting on your feed looking at the next thing, scrolling for the next update. Uh, if you're actually in an engaged experience in that, I think that's where mobile video will take off. So this is the big story of uh, next year and has actually been um, the big story of the latter half of this year, which is that ads are content too. And there's a few reasons that ads are content. Um, so one of them is just, and people talk a great deal about creating content for brands, but this is actually a, a more basic approach that we're doing, which is just, can you make the ads look pretty on everything, right? Not a 300 by 250 isn't going to fit on every device. A standard IAB isn't going to fit perfect on every device. Uh, so one of the things we're doing is responsive ads, which is um, they can either be adaptive, which is you create standard sizes that snap to each uh, screen size, or we actually are building for some of our advertisers responsive ads, which means that it's pixel perfect on every device. Uh, it doesn't matter what screen size you have. We're going to serve up the perfect ad that looks great, that doesn't get in the way of the experience. Um, so really, anything you do with your content on these new devices, you need to do uh, with your ads, too. They need to resize. They need to look great. They need to be responsive as well. Um, so let's see if my clicker is responsive. There we go. Um, the rise of native advertising. So this is what everyone's talking about. It started off with Twitter and Facebook and all these updates in the streams, and then everyone who was uh, a news organization that was tapped into these social networks started uh, doing it too. Um, we've actually been doing native advertising for about four years. Um, it was called custom content at the time. It's the same thing, um, which is to say that what if, you know, if people are paying attention to their feeds, if they're paying attention to streams of content, if they're paying attention to the news on your homepage, uh, what if they could actually, um, what if the advertising was actually part of that experience rather than being off to the side, rather than being a display ad that's, that's maybe getting less engagement than being in the stream? So Twitter has uh, these promoted tweets. This one's in search, but basically getting your tweet in the stream and paying for that. And Facebook, as we know, um, and it's been somewhat controversial over the last few weeks, but basically they've been trying to find ways that they can charge brands to get more visibility in the stream. So if you want to reach all your Facebook fans uh, or your Facebook likers, then, uh, then you can get a sponsored post in the stream. So what does this mean for news organizations? Well, native advertising helps brands maximize the reach of their content and drive performance metrics. So... Here are some of the reasons that we actually like uh, native advertising. Um, and to be clear, when you're doing it as a news brand, it's a different thing because anything you put out there is kind of, uh, it's assumed that that's some kind of editorial judgment about uh, whatever topic you're talking about. So the way we do native, which I'll speak through, is uh, the brand doesn't get to tell us what to write. We just say, 
You know, you want to reach this particular demographic. You want to reach people who are highly connected on social networks and into gadgets. Well, we will create a series about uh, gadgets or gadgets in the home, but we won't speak about your products and, you know, your branding will be around it. Um, so that's important with regards to native advertising that it's not advertorial, but it's about creating a win-win situation where the reader really wants to read and share the content and uh, the advertiser is getting a positive association around great content that isn't actually talking about their products or services. Um, so content lives in the stream with stories, photos, and video. We actually like this as well because it makes our site a lot prettier. Um, content gets shared by social media users. Ads don't tend to get shared um, unless they're really great uh, video ads, which, you know, viral marketing is really taking off for advertising. But generally speaking, people aren't copy and pasting the display ads. Uh, unless you do, I don't know. Uh, content helps build following and engagement on social sites. Uh, content and social is the future of search. Content's inherently cross-platform. And content and native advertising drives performance. So you get this so-called um, uplift benefit, right, when you have native advertising that not only does your stuff get seen more, but then if it's really compelling, if you do a series that people really want to share, then they're actually becoming uh, marketers for you and they're pushing the content around the web, which when you have a social audience like we do, uh, it's incredibly powerful. So I think native advertising is going to be the story of next year. Um, for us, it lets us focus on which, what we do best, which is create content that people want to share. And you know, if a brand wants to define a theme and we get to write stuff that's really shareable on that theme, and they also happen to get the positive association, then great. Um, so our campaigns team is, is who does this at Mashable. They work directly with brands and agencies to create original content. Um, they develop social distribution. So one of the things that we actually try to do is say, well, if it matters that the stuff gets shared, let's come up with ideas to make people engage with it more. So we do things like Google Hangouts around the themes of the series, um, or we'll create a hashtag and so that if people want to discuss, you know, we had a series about startups um, sponsored by uh, Microsoft, I think. And um, we had people who were entrepreneurs creating a hashtag, talking about those topics, using it, had a hangout with the entrepreneurs to try and figure out, well, you know, how do I do a startup? What should I know? Um, and they conduct on-site training and workshops in, hey, what's the best, what's the best practices for this stuff? Um, so the, the success kid says that the best campaign of the future is create compelling content, uh, live where your customers are, amplify your content, leverage all your platforms, and design for optimal experience that will delight users on every platform. So this is another reason why people are talking about native a great deal and why we're very excited about it, is that these mobile screens are very small and you might have seen that the big advertising story this year is that dollars are not moving from the desktop to mobile, but readers are. So that's the big challenge. We have probably about 30% of our readers on mobile right now, probably going to go up to 50% next year. Um, and for news organizations, if display advertising doesn't move as quickly as the readers move, well, what do you do? So native advertising is a really nice solution to that problem because it says, hey, the stories are right there in the stream. So it doesn't matter if you're on your mobile device or your tablet. It really doesn't matter where the reader is. It's going to look just as great, and it's going to get consumed just as much on those devices. Uh, so when it comes to the ad story, which I think you'll hear a bit more about today, uh, mobile advertising, I think, will move, and mobile display will move. And I think responsive advertising will be a big part of that. But native is also a big step forward uh, for news organizations to say, well, how do we create really great advertising that works on mobile devices as well? Um, so we'll pitch you for 10 seconds on the new one. Um, this is our new site. It's coming out on Tuesday. Mark your calendars. Uh, it's got social. Content is organized by social velocity and optimized for sharing. It's mobile, so both the content and the ads look great on every device and every platform. And it's visual. So as I said earlier, social sites are going visual. We see a lot of our readers moving sites like Pinterest, where they're sharing our stories as an image instead of sharing as a headline, which is what used to be the behavior we saw in places like Facebook and Twitter. Um, 
images are shared two times more than links. And on our site, images are shared eight times more, which is to say that if we post to Facebook with an image versus a headline, we're getting eight times as much uh, engagement as if we just post the headline. So great imagery is incredibly important. Um, this is our new homepage, as I just showed you. Uh, this is uh, article pages. This is actually uh, kind of native advertising in a way. It's a series uh, on a specific topic that an advertiser has defined, and you can use your right and left arrow keys just to whiz through stories, or you can swipe through them as well. Um, and we think it's really important because collections of stories typically get lost in that reverse chronological kind of uh, way that people used to read. So what we're doing is we're trying to bundle uh, like stories into these collections, and then people can just whiz through them with their arrow keys or with a swipe and consume all the content. Um, optimizing for every reader, as I said, responsive design we think is key for next year. I think it's going to be really frustrating next year if you load up a link on your mobile phone and you have to do the pinchy thing and try and read the text, and you need to double tap on the on the text to try and read it, and then you need to uh, swipe across to read the rest of it. It's going to get really annoying if news sites are like that, and I think readers are going to move to aggregators and consumer content elsewhere, or maybe not consumer content at all if it's a really tough experience to read on their mobile devices. Um, so responsive design, responsive ad serving. We're doing infinite scroll, which is to say that we don't have pagination anymore. We think it's kind of uh, annoying to have to go back four pages to read all the stuff that we've just published today. Uh, so as users scroll down our page, we're actually going to load in more content, more advertising too, because that's a really engaged reader that's searching for more and more stuff. Uh, and they're paying attention to the stream, right? Their eye line is right there on the content. Um, so that is infinite scroll. You'll have seen it on most social sites at this point. And we think that news organizations should, uh, should consider doing it, too. It's very possible now with the new technologies. Uh, and also, a lot of multimedia. Um, and one thing I didn't talk through, but I, I guess I'll talk through it on the next one, is we actually don't think that the page is the only shareable unit on your website. We actually see people downloading images and then re-uploading them on their Facebook or saving them and putting them on their Pinterest. Um, so we actually uh, think that not only is imagery so important that we're investing in it and we have an image editor and we have our own image library and we take our own images of all the gadgets and stuff we review, uh, but we also think that, uh, that this stuff is independently shareable. We call it micro-content sharing. And um, what we do is we break down the page into separate pieces. So you can hover over an image and share it, but also we're doing block quotes, that kind of thing. So if you see a quote on the page you like, you can share that out, and that will become the headline on your Twitter um, instead of the uh, headline. So we think it's really important to let readers uh, share individual pieces of the story. And what we're actually working on next is optimizing our home page based on that content. So we can say, actually, this is the best image in this post. We're going to use this to represent it everywhere. And we're going to have this image be the default one that's shared if people don't select a specific image. Uh, so breaking down the page into individual components is something that's now technically possible. It's definitely not easy, but it's technically possible. And we've done it, and we think it's going to be awesome. Um, and we're also starting to uh, do a lot of inbound image licensing so we can get really great big phot uh, photography because one of the other trends that's happening right now is that people are starting to get higher and higher resolution uh, machines on their desktop. Those few people who are buying PCs are buying super high-end ones like uh, Retina MacBook Pros where uh, if you don't have the highest resolution imagery and you don't have the largest best imagery, it's starting to show uh, on those screens. So we're doing that too. We're also rethinking display. We're displaying the ads in the stream now. We're, uh, we're loading ads as the user scrolls. Once you get onto a new page load, you're getting new ads. And uh, they're optimized for every device. And they can tell stories. We're actually doing, and I'll talk through these a little bit. I might be on the next one. Um, we're actually doing something we call Storyteller. They look a bit different now that they're actually live on the beta site. But the idea of this is that you can have ads that tell a story down the page. So you could say, Top 10 tips for mobile photography. Number one goes there. You scroll down to the next page. You get tip number two. You get tip number three. And then as you uh, get to the bottom, maybe, maybe there's a, a mention of the brand or something. But the idea is that, uh, that you can tell a story down the page and that the reader might actually scroll to view the ads, which we think would be really fun if they actually were looking to view more ads because they were useful enough. 
so that's storyteller units, tell a story as you go down the page. They're probably going to be in our left column. Uh, we have native ads in stream. So uh, of these units, uh, anyone can be uh, an ad, as it were, which is just to say it's content that an advertiser uh, backed, but we decided what it would be. Um, we're also doing uh, brand lift units. This is something we're experimenting with, which is to say that if a brand wants from us to be socially shared and to reach a really influential audience that shares a great deal, do they already have great content out there that does not talk about their brand, but which is really useful to uh, an influential audience online? Uh, so in some cases, we're actually experimenting as well with, let's just give lift to your stuff. Uh, and, and if it's super shareable and we put it in front of our audience, presumably it's going to be even more shareable. And not only that, we can tell you of all your stuff what's going to be the most shareable because we have an algorithm that predicts that. So uh, that's what we're playing around with now is to say what's out there that, that our readers are going to really want. Um, we're also, obviously, as I was saying, we're doing responsive advertising that resizes perfectly to every screen. Um, and this is our... Native ad solution, we've been doing this, like I say, for four years, but now in the new site, gets even better placement. Um, it looks really good. It's just like a story you want to read and engage with, and they get many, many more, more clicks. And not only that, but the advertising that we put around uh, native advertising, the, C, uh, the uh, display advertising gets clicked about twice as much on our site um, than versus on a, on a normal post. So not only do you get all the benefits of uh, actually having a story that's read and consumed and shared, but when people actually read that post, they're far more likely to click on the display advertising as well. So it's kind of like a huge halo effect that goes around it. And that would indicate to us as well that maybe display isn't dead, that it just takes you know, a bit of packaging. If you put in the extra work, if you put in native advertising with it, then display becomes twice as effective. Um, so here are our four rules uh, for news websites in 2013. They've got to be mobile first, not desktop. Build for the screen right here, and everything else flows. Um, this is actually something we experienced when building the new site, because we started off building for this big screen, and then we realized that this tiny device could not load all that code very quickly. So what we did was we scrapped it, and we started again building for the phone, and then building out, because that was the device that uh, had the least processing power, so needed the smallest footprint. Um, so if you build for mobile first, everything else follows. And what's also nice about designing for the phone is that your actual website ends up being a lot simpler because you're really forced to think about, well, what don't we need? Um, social first, not search. This is at least the way we think about things. Um, you have huge archives of content, and I'm sure they get searched a lot. But what we're finding is that really if we focus on social, um, that everything else follows. The more social shares we get, the higher we rank um, with those stories. Visuals really do matter. Uh, great visuals are shared many, many more times. For us, it's about eight times as much on Facebook as doing a text-based update. And for these new screens, they need to be really high quality. And by the way, people really, really like to consume your stories with a visual to hook them because they can figure out what the story is about much, much faster. And that's why on our new homepage, there's really huge visuals. We consider them to be gaining importance. It's not just about the headline as it was when you were sharing it on Twitter. Originally, it's now about, well, what if they share it on Pinterest? What if they actually want to share the image on their Facebook? Um, and we want them to do that because that story will get more engagement if they share an image. Um, Ads are content too, so native advertising is going to be the advertising story. I'm sure we'll have some people uh, talking about ads in this trend, but essentially the reason that native advertising is taking off is it's socially shareable. People want to engage with it. It gets a lot of uplift on social networks, and we think that we have the, the best audience to do that because we have the online influencers. But it's also because it works great on mobile phones, and because that is the smallest screen and because the display ad while it will look great and work there, it's not going to be as huge as if you had it on a desktop. So the key thing about native there is that it looks great on mobile phone screens. It's just as shareable. It's just as easy to consume on a small screen. Mobile first, social first, visuals matter, and ads as content. I would say the four things if you're uh, working on news sites in 2013, if your news site is not looking amazing, on uh, mobile devices, um, 
Or if you're consuming new sites, you'll start to notice a little bit in 2013 that if they're not looking great there, that you might want to go elsewhere. So increasingly, experience, user experience is really important. Uh, it's not just the content, but it's the whole package. People are having great experiences on their mobile devices. That's why they're buying iPads instead of PCs. They're simpler. They're more fun. You get these little apps, these little nuggets of content. And if your website isn't as fun, as engaging, uh, as all the apps and the websites that they're browsing now on these devices, uh, then people might go elsewhere. And that's really uh, why packaging is going to be incredibly important in 2013. So... And I did look like Felix Baumgartner, don't you think? <laughs> huh? Thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs>